international differences in economic development. As a global leader or manager, one has to recognize there are differences among nations in terms of economic development. However, every country, regardless of economic development, can be a potential market for global growth. The key is to look at the attractiveness of the country through trends that foster greater economic development by the implementation of democratic reforms, market-based economic reforms, and legal systems to better enforce property rights. Gross national income per capita is the dollar value of the country's final income in a year divided by its population. It should be reflecting the average before tax income of a country's citizens. Knowing a country's GNI per capita is a good step toward understanding the country's economic strengths and needs, as well as the general standard of living enjoyed by the average citizen. A country's GNI per capita tends to be closely linked with other indicators that measure the social, the economic, and the environmental well-being of the country and its people. Gross national income per capita is important to understand, but does not reflect its growth potential for a company looking to expand. For example, the top five GNI per capita for 2018 are Liechtenstein, Bermuda, Switzerland, Norway, and Luxembourg. Yet, these are relatively small markets in terms of population size and will most likely not be an attractive market for expansion growth. On the other hand, countries like Burundi, Malawi, Mozambique, and Sierra Leone have gross national income per capita of less than $500 a year. However, given the population size of these countries, there could be a potential market for growth. One thing to remember, for the lower tier countries, there often exists a strong black market economy that would not be reflective in the official statistics. A country's economic development is often tied to the relationship between economic and political systems. One of the most important aspects of economic development revolves around how innovations and entrepreneurship are encouraged. Innovation should be viewed as new products, new processes, new organizations, new management practices, and new strategies, while entrepreneurship can be viewed as the first to commercialize innovative products and processes. To be clear, companies can do both and be both, as well as individuals. Their important point to remember is that either or both are significant drivers to economic development and growth. Innovation and entrepreneurship requires a market economy as there is little incentive to develop new innovations and planned economies because the state owns all means of production and therefore all the gains. There is a strong relationship between economic freedom and economic growth. Many economists have proven that countries with favorable geography are more likely to engage in trade and are more open to market-based systems. Equally important, countries that invest in education have higher growth rates because their workforce is more productive. That is why countries in the Southeast Asia area have been able to offset their geographical disadvantage by investing in education domestically and internationally. The shift toward a market-based system involves deregulation, privatization, and a legal system to safeguard property rights. Deregulation in command economies involves removing price controls, abolishing laws regulating the establishment and operation of private enterprise, and relaxing or removing restrictions on direct investment by foreign companies. To be clear, There are some mixed economies who have initiated the same initiative to achieve deregulation. Privatization is a great way to stimulate economic efficiency 
and was started in Great Britain in the 1980s by the Prime Minister Maggie Thatcher. In many nations, economic activity is still in the hands of state-owned enterprises and is stifling economic development. The selling of state-owned enterprises may not be enough to guarantee economic growth. It must be paired with a general deregulation in the opening of the economy. Finally, economic transformation to a well-functioning market economy requires laws that, one, protect property rights, and two, provide mechanisms for contract enforcement. Every organization has to weigh the benefits, the cost, risk, and overall attractiveness of entering a new foreign market or expanding into an existing one. Countries that are highly attractive have higher sustained rates of economic growth due to democratic regimes, market-based economy policies, and strong property rights protection. Overall, attractiveness of a potential market to international business depends on balancing the benefits, the cost, and risk associated with doing business in that country. Other things being equal, the benefit-cost-risk trade-off is likely to be most favorable in politically stable, developed, and developing nations that have freer market systems and no dramatic upsurge in either inflation rates or private sector debt. Many concepts were covered here and in the reading. It is important to understand they all play an important role in determining the attractiveness of a foreign market. As a potential manager or leader in the global finance arena, one has to be so much more aware of factors that can impact the success of an opportunity in a foreign market. Many of the concepts presented here most likely would never have been thought of if the company wanted to expand its operations from Minnesota to South Dakota or from Minnesota to Georgia. Yes, there may be a need to examine a few concepts in detail if expanding to places like California where environmental regulations are stricter than most states. However, it is when you cross a national boundary, the domestic country has to closely examine the political, economic systems of the new market.